the first expression of God's love towards His creation, towards man, is, it starts with a question. And the question is, where are you? God came to meet Adam and Eve, and He questions, where are you? Now, do you think that God was unaware of where they were? Not really. The question has an intention. And the intention is clearly that man will question also himself and that man will become aware that they committed a sin, that God is there, and they need to have a small conversation with God. Now, certain times when it's uh, late uh, at night and uh, I'm sure you, you, your, your parents do this, you don't know where your children are, and you call them or you send a text message, and you do the same question. Where are you? Some moms here? <laughs> All right. So can you relate with God? God is looking for His creation. It's like His children. He loves them. And uh, He asks, where are you? The difference between God and ourselves is that often we don't know where other people are, but God knows everything about us. He knows exactly where you are. He knows where you're hiding. He knows even what you're thinking. God knows everything. But even though He knows everything, He asks, where are you? Now, further in the, uh, in the Bible, and I would, I would like us to go now to Acts chapter 2, and, and let us apply this message to our personal experience of life. Many times we might think, well, where am I? Uh, well, I'm in a good place, I'm in a good situation of my life. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of a church, I attend church, I'm saved, I'm with Christ, I'm with the Lord, I'm with Jesus. But so many times we, uh, as Christians, don't understand that spiritually we can be in a place either in the place of blessing or in a place of curse and it's not God's will that as Christians we, are, uh, we live under a curse we're not experimenting victory blessing miracles answer to our prayers and often this happens because Christians are in a place where they're hiding from God or, or they're hiding from themselves. They don't understand where they are spiritually. And this is what this message is all about. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we can read about the first message ever preached in the history of the church. So, until uh, Golgotha, the crucifixion of our Lord, uh, people were living, living under an old covenant. Now, we, take, we took communion, and communion represents the establishment of the new covenant. But Jesus Christ lived under the old covenant. And in fact, we have the Gospels that talk about the life of Jesus. But that period of His life was still a period where mankind was under the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant. So Jesus lived under the Old Covenant. But he came to establish a new covenant. The old covenant was a, a, a covenant or an alliance between God and Jewish families. So salvation and the, God's blessing was coming through the world through the Jews, through the Jewish people, through Israel. And so Jesus Christ had a very specific message targeting Jewish people and Israel. However, he announced that the covenant was going to bring a greater blessing over all mankind. So here we have the first message of the church and this happened in Jerusalem. Peter uh, was leading uh, this group of Christians that gathered to seek the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came, they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. There were specific signs People saw like uh, tongues of fire over the heads of all those Christians that were gathering there. There were not a whole lot of people. Uh, there were just 120. 
which is less than we usually have here uh, in, in church on Sundays, but those 120 were committed to the Lord, were committed to seek uh, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, church, when we commit to seek the Lord and the presence of God, we don't need actually more than 120 people to win the whole world. Amen. And those 120 that were committed, and by the end of the day, they became 3,000. Right after this message. And during the message, we're not going to read the whole message, but I would like to read verse 17 to start. It says, um, And in the last days shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. This is uh, Peter uh, preaching, or uh, this is Paul, I'm sorry, preaching about the book of Joel about the book of Joel and he's quoting a scripture from Joel and saying this happened today before your eyes God is doing this and and so he continues the message and uh, let, let's jump now to verse 19 because I don't want to focus just on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit but on verse 19 he says uh, and again he's quoting the book of jo Joel he says I will show wonders in the heavens above signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day and on verse 21 he says and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved this is a great statement and this is the the, the, the high point of this speech and this is also the high point of my message today this statement whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved it doesn't matter if they were Jews if they were men or women if they were black or white it doesn't matter if they were rich or poor it really doesn't matter the Lord is saying these are the last days the last days are now this message is for today and what the Lord is saying is doesn't matter who you are if you call upon the name of the Lord you shall be saved amen do you believe the Word of God church you truly believe the Word of God now this message it's not just for the church this message is for everyone so uh, you know I had some people that um, question my message of salvation saying that a, a gay person cannot be saved or a drug addict cannot be saved or an alcoholic cannot be saved listen you're listening to the to the wrong gospel whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved so and this is the message that the church should be preaching to the world do you think salvation is an exclusive of the church this, is, this was the wrong attitude of the Jewish people because they said salvation is only for us, the Jews. But the Lord said, no, it's not. It's for all creation. Yes, it came from Israel, but it's to the whole world. So it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, if you're Greek, if you're South Korean or North Korean, if you came from the Caribbean islands, if you came from Europe, if you were born in Canada, it doesn't matter who you are. Salvation is free, is available, is for everyone, it's for you, church. Give the hand of applause to the Lord, to the Lord. Now, this was a shocking message. But they were convinced because as, as Paul was preaching the gospel, he went through scripture, through the Old uh, uh, Testament, and he explained who Jesus was. And by the end of the message, and we go now to verse 36, he finishes like this. Let the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him Jesus, both Lord and Christ, Jesus, whom you crucified. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the earth so that they were just convinced and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles brother brothers what shall we do brothers what shall we do so not only they were convinced of the gospel but they were committed and decided to do something about it and the message of the gospel it's not meant to be just listened to to be heard the message of the gospel requires an action when you listen to the gospel you may just say well i don't agree with this i reject this message 
Or you might come to the point, like these Jews in Jerusalem, where you say, so what can I do? What can I do? And as Christians, we know that salvation is free. It's freely available. It's for all of us. That's the message of the church. This is the message of the gospel. It's free. It's available. However, it requires an action. Now, when we talk about message, we talk about communication. And so, Peter makes this and he says on verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. By other words, he's saying, you need to be baptized, you need to, be, to repent, you need to die to yourselves, and you need to be born again to a new life, to a new season in your life. And uh, there's some rules of godly communication. And I, I, I'm going to ask you to put this slide over there, rules of godly communication. You know, when I talk to God, that is when I'm praying, I apply these rules. And I also try to apply these rules when I talk to someone. And those are simple things that we should do in order to communicate well. When I talk to someone, or when you talk to someone, be sure the other part is listening. Remember the verse that we studied our message, our verse for today. God asks, where are you? It's not that God was unaware of where Adam and Eve were, but he wanted to call them, call their attention and, and just say, where are you? Are you there? Are you listening? Are you listening? Can you recognize me? Where are you? And so when God brings a messenger like me, I'm just a messenger here, he wants to make sure that you are listening. One of the techniques that God uses to preach His message sometimes is to say something that can hurt your feelings. We don't like our feelings to be hurt. But listen, when you're doing something wrong, if someone is your friend and loves you, they might even hurt your feelings to make sure that you're listening. And this is how God works. Listen, Jesus Christ was preaching the message. Do you know how many times they tried to kill Jesus because he was preaching God's message? Why? Because they were offended. Why were they offended? Because they were in sin. You know that Christians can be in sin? There's many sins in the church. Christians can be in sin. Sins of disobedience. Sins of disloyalty. Sins of procrastinating change in their lives. Sin of not doing good. You know when you, you know how to do good and you don't do it, you're committing a sin? Sins of being unfaithful in their finances. There's all sorts of sins. So when you listen to God's message and when you come to church, if you have an open heart, you will receive well. But if your heart has some trouble and some problems, if there's some certain areas in your life that are hiding, you're in a hide, then the message of sanctification and holiness will be shocking. But God wants to make sure that you're listening. The second thing, when you're in doubt, you ask for clarification. Very often when I speak with my wife, and we, we do not agree in a, in a subject or in a matter, and she tells me what she thinks, I ask for clarification. And I say, okay, let, let me see if I understand. What you're telling me is this. And I want to be sure that she clarifies what she thinks. That's what we should do when we have good communication. So when I'm talking to God, when I'm praying, and if the Lord tells me, I want you to do this, I ask for clarification. I say, Lord, I want to be sure. Sometimes I even ask for a sign. You know, the reason why I'm here serving the Lord as your pastor is because the Lord guided me here and He confirmed both with you and, and with me that I should be here as your pastor. But I need clarification. And often I say, Lord, confirm my steps. And He does it all the time. Now when we talk to one another, when, you see, when you have a conversation with someone, maybe sometimes an argument or a difference of, of opinion, you ask for clarification if you want to have good communication. Then, when you need something, ask it. And ask it the right way. 
Many of you are retired, but the majority of you, you have a work, you have a job, and you have a boss. How many of you would like to have a raise? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. Unless, you know, the business is doing really well, and they want to bless you, they see that you're doing a good job. But certain times, you need to ask for things, and you ask the right way. Sometimes you're in a, in a line of people and you, you, you're waiting to, for your time on the line in order to be served by someone. You, you need something, you're over there. You're not going to cut people just because you think you deserve to be served ahead of others. There's rules. You respect those rules. You know, when you, you're on the road, and you do something wrong and the police stops you and they ask for your driver's license. If the policeman comes to you and it's off Officer Joel, you don't say, hi Joel. You treat him with respect. You address him the right way. Yes, Officer, Officer, Officer Joel. Yes, yes sir. Here are the documents. Please don't find me. I know I did wrong. Are you following me? If you ever have to go to a court, the judge is there. There's a right way to address the judge. If you don't know it, just watch Judge Judy. <laughs> don't treat Judge Judy wrongly because you'll be in trouble. She speaks it out. <laughs> There's a right way to address the judge. There's a right way to address an officer. There's a right way to address a pastor. Now this is really sad. I'm not preaching my message, I'm preaching God's message. But there's a right way to address people, and there's a right way to address God. Yes. And the right way to address God is with a humble heart. You come to the Lord, not with pride in your heart, but we come, you come humbly to the Lord, and you come in the name of Jesus, and you say, Lord, I am here because of the sacrifice that was done for me. I'm righteous enough to come before you, not because of me, but because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for me. That is the right way to address God. And when you address God in the right way, you're communicating right. Then you revise your thoughts and you need to take action. This is what the first church did. They listened to the message. Peter preached the message and they said, what shall we do? Then they revised what they heard and they said, what shall we do? And finally, when God talks, make sure you obey immediately. Immediately. Sometimes we don't obey. Sometimes we think, oh, this is just me. Listen, I've learned when I drive home, I've learned I can, I can take two or three different roads to get there. But I've learned to be in prayer. And many times I just feel in my spirit, take this road. And I learn not to disobey. I've learned that small decisions in our life can lead to good consequences or can lead to a bad destiny. We need to listen to God. We need to have the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we need to have good communication with God. If you think that God is not speaking, something is wrong in your end. Because God continues to speak. God is still present. God is still asking, where are you? And you might be on the height. And say, I want to be away from God. I want to be away from the church. I want to be away from this situation. Don't hide from God because it's not possible. It's not possible. You can hide from people. You can hide all your life. But one day you'll be in the presence of God. Who loves you. He doesn't want to judge you. And He wants you to be saved. Now let's move further in this message. What is the difference between repentance and remorse? Because God wants us to take an action and he wants repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10, Paul says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's two kinds of sorrow. <coughs> when you say, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, I messed up, I did this, I shouldn't, I'm so sorry. Godly sorrow is a good thing. Produces what? Salvation. Now, the, 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 the sorrow of the world 
And the sorrow of the world is what we might call remorse. It's good for nothing. It's when people, for instance, they offend you, and they know they did wrong, and then they say, well, if I did something wrong, forgive me. That's sorrow of the world. That's, that's the way the world is sorry. But the, world, the way the church is sorry, it's not with remorse. It's with genuine repentance. It's coming to a person or to God and say, I'm really sorry. I did wrong. Please forgive me. And it comes from the heart. You see, one day two people were praying at the temple. And there was this man doing this loud prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm not like the, these people. These pagan people. These people that don't love you. Oh, God, I, I'm so thankful I'm not a woman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because they, they thought women were inferior, be, inferior beings. And then this, there's this man that comes and, and, and he just touches the chest and says, I'm a sinner, forgive me God! And Jesus said, this one was saved, justified. That other one, it is work. <laughs> you see, walking with the Lord is a work in progress. When you think that you're above others, that you're above reproach, that you know better, watch out. Because God might be still asking, where are you? And you say, well, thank God I'm not a woman. Thank God I'm not like this. Thank God that I'm a Pentecostal. I'm not a Roman Catholic. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And the Lord is looking at you and saying, man, I sent my son to die for you. And you think you're so righteous because of what you do, because of your prayers, because of your beliefs. Humbleness will release God's grace. Sorrow, the sorrow of the world, doesn't produce anything good. Let me just wrap up this message in my last point. I want to talk about the spirit that comes and attacks the church, which is the spirit of Judas. You know the story of Judas. He walked with, with Jesus. He was one of the apostles. Three years with Jesus. He was so good and trustworthy that he was in charge of the finances. So he was in the inner core of the Lord Jesus. However, he betrayed the Lord. And he betrayed the Lord with an expression of love. With a kiss. You see, I'm not very impressed with kiss, kissing and hugging. Except if it, if it is my wife. <laughs> but when someone kisses me or hugs me, I like it. Some of you hug me. I really appreciate that you hug me. But I'm not very impressed with just a hug, but with who you are indeed. Because here's Judas kissing the Lord for money, kissing the Lord for his own purposes. Now it was written in Psalm 41 verse 9, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. So we know that Jesus was aware of Judas' heart. He was aware to the point that when they, they had communion and he uh, was taking the first supper, not the last supper, but the first supper with the disciples. You see people put the, the last supper. So it was the first supper, not, not the last. So he was taking the supper and Judas was there and he even gave an opportunity for this guy to repent. And he said, the, the hand of the one who betrays me is here. Quoting that's the, the book of Psalms. Now Judas Iscariot, after he betrayed Jesus, he was remorseful. He said, I did something wrong. But he wasn't repentant. You can put the next slide. And uh, if he was repentant, he would have come to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. You see, sometimes we do things that are wrong. You know, Brent, if I do something wrong against you, should I apologize to Nash? <laughs> of course not. That's the sorrow of the world. Oh, I got caught. I did something. Ooh. But true repentance. I go to the person that I've offended and I say, I'm truly sorry. 
You see, in the church, we have too many people that are remorseful and that are sorry, but it's the sorrow of the world. It produces zero. But the sorrow, which is a godly sorrow, which is repentance, will lead to salvation. Do you want to be saved? Yes. I want to keep on the track of salvation. So Judas turned to the religious leaders. Turned to another pastor. So he betrayed his pastor and turns to another one, trying to find comfort. And you know what the religious leader said? Well, too bad. You, you did something wrong, too bad. That's between you and whoever. And he went out and he hanged himself. And he lost his life. That's the spirit of Judas. The, the spirit of Judas betrays those who should be in a place of honor and then asks for forgiveness to a person that has no spiritual authority over him or her. And let me tell you that some Christians, unfortunately, they fall into the same mistake. Yes, they walk with the Lord. They even partake from, from, the, from the table. They're with the Lord. They're leaders. They're at the table. But they have a spirit of betrayal. And listen to me. I don't want to offend anyone. I'm here. I'm the messenger. Don't shoot me. Don't kill me. But let me tell you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we shouldn't allow anything coming from the enemy in our hearts. Godly sorrow, repentance. Worldly sorrow, remorse. What is the difference? It's like when you, you get caught. You know, Judas turned to religion. And, uh, and uh, when we get caught, we don't make a decision. What is repentance? Can you go to the next slide, two slides ahead? The repentance, it's a decision. In the New Testament, the word is metanoia, which is based on, uh, on something that means to change one's mind. When I repent, I change my mind. Worldly sorrow, I'm remorseful and I try to change your mind. Okay? You got it? It's like you get caught speeding in a school zone. You're driving at 80 kilometers per hour. And you should be driving at 30. You, get, you got caught. And, and you tell the officer, I'm really sorry. I was in a hurry. You see, you try to justify yourself. Oh, I got caught. I can't believe I, I was caught. So the problem is not that you did something wrong, but that you were caught. See, it's like, let me move further, uh, and, uh, and let me mention just salvation at Calvary, and this is my last point, and we're going to finish wrap up here. When Jesus was crucified, He was crucified between two criminals. You know the story? So, we have a slide there, it's a bit dark, so we can move to the next one. In Luke 23, one of the criminals, looked at Jesus and he said, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Is this a good thing? Yes, it is. Save me. Save yourself and save us. What he said is right. See, it's not just what you say. It's what you mean. It's your heart. He said the right thing. Save yourself and save us. Remember, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it's not the words that matter. What matters to the Lord, it's really what's deep inside of you. Because he was saying this out of the mockery. He was saying the right words with the wrong tone. And the other one on the other side, on verse 40, he says, He rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since we are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be in paradise. Awesome. You see, God prepared Calvary. This was not prepared by the devil. How many of you watched the Olympics, the opening of the Olympics? Some of you? I, I like to watch the, the, those ceremonies. I really do. 
and uh, it's very high tech, and they, and they tell a story. They have 10,000 volunteers to tell the story that they wanted, and everything was uh, planned to the detail. <laughs> So it started in the Middle Ages and, and then they changed things and then ends up today and fireworks and they spent almost uh, two hours with that very elaborate ceremony. Let me tell you, Calvary was prepared by God. It wasn't prepared by the devil. God prepared every single person and appointed every single person to be there. How do I know this? Because Calvary is the most important event of the history of mankind. Amen. Calvary is the most important point of man's history. It's not Christmas or the birth of Jesus. It's Calvary. Everyone that should be there was there. The Roman soldiers. People spitting in Jesus' face. The two criminals. Everyone was there by divine appointment. Nothing was taken, taken by accident here. It was godly planned. No, there's no accidents in God. Those two criminals are there with a purpose. Because those two criminals represent you and me. In fact, I, I will go to the point of telling you, they represent the church. Yes, because we were criminals, but we were taken to the cross. You know when Jesus told about the parable of the ten virgins, that half of them were wise and half were foolish, and the end came and only half was saved? Let me tell you that this is the perfect image of the Lord saying, only half of my church will be saved. So don't take it for granted. If you're here, it's because of God's mercy. If you're here, it's because we were crucified with Christ, as the Bible says. So we represent either the guy on the left or the guy on the right. Who are you? Put the last slide. There are two destinations. One is heaven, another one is hell. These two thieves were in the same condition of Christ. They identified with Christ in His sufferings. Like you should, like I should. One said the right words, save us, like you did. But the other one was a step further. The, one, the, the other one had repentance. The other one recognized he doesn't deserve to do this. He doesn't deserve to be here. I deserve to be here. He doesn't deserve to be here. You see, when we come to Christ, it's not a matter just of choice. But divinely, God placed you here today in this church, South Shore so you can make a decision.